Well, good evening. Good evening. Good to see everybody tonight. Uh, I don't know about you all. I mean, after 10 months, I was about to roll over and get my second nap in this afternoon, uh, but I didn't do it. So I appreciate seeing everybody out tonight. It's such a, such a good thing to be together again on a Sunday afternoon. And uh, we're, certainly, we're certainly blessed in that. Uh, not every congregation can do this for a number of reasons, and we have the opportunity to. So before we start, we're going to study out of the Gospel of Matthew tonight, of course. Uh, but before we start, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for the good things you do for us in our lives. We know that you take care of us in every way we need. We know that you love us, Father, as a father, truly. And we pray, Father, we're more like your children. We pray, Father, as we strive to be more like your sons and daughters, that we'd imitate your son. And as we study your word this night and the nights that you give us to study, we pray that we'd imitate him in the way that we read, in the way that he served, in the way he loved you, in the way he sought to serve you. In all those ways, Father, we pray that we're better people tonight and always, both for you and for others in this world that we can serve. We pray in his name. Amen. All right. Well, again, good to see everybody tonight. And you can open up, of course, to the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, the Gospel accounts, of course, um, well studied. Virtually everybody in here, if you're visiting with us and have never read one of the Gospel accounts front to back, then you should. Each one's a little bit different. Uh, like many have found out before, they've read them through. Uh, the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, mirror each other to some degree. John stands apart in some ways. And amid those four Gospels, you get four different views of the Savior. Uh, just like you'd ask four different people what they thought of you, they'd give you probably four different varied ways of looking at you. So the Gospel accounts give us four different ways to look at the Lord's life. And in Matthew's account, anybody know what the traditional view of Matthew is? And I will ask questions. Uh, I will not, like some people, not naming names, Wally Hayes, walk up to you and stand over you, right, and make you answer. It's an old teacher's trick that Wally uses. Um, he claims he was imitating somebody. I don't believe him. I think he just likes to imit uh, intimidate people. Uh, but I will ask questions. Uh, what's the traditional view of Matthew's gospel? Who's it written to? Who's Matthew's gospel written to? Well, of course. Boy, I tell you what. It's written to the Jews, for the Jews, by a Jew. Well, you said that with great confidence, Don. How can we be sure? I mean, what, what's a piece of evidence that we know? Because I'll tell you, we, we can't. In 13 settings, we cannot study every last verse of the Gospel of Matthew. It's, I would like to do that. We would never get through. The Sermon on the Mount alone, uh, you could take 13 classes with. And so I think we need to look at kind of an overview of what Matthew's about, uh, what the Gospel writer intends to do, and take from that what I think are or at least a couple of the major themes from the gospel account. One is, of course, who is Jesus? I and mean, Jesus tries to explain who he is. This is who I am, right? He does that in the gospel of John. He certainly does that in Matthew, explaining how he is the king. He is the king, their spiritual king. And also what the kingdom is. If I'm a king, I have a kingdom. Let me tell you about my kingdom. And so he does that, and that's what I want to focus on. But the fact that it's written to the Jews, and we do, we, we've been taught that. I think there's evidence for that. What's one piece of evidence for that? If you're writing to someone and you're trying to relate to them, what kind of language are you going to use, right? If you're speaking to someone or trying to speak to someone and teach them in Spanish, you're not going to use German. And if you're trying to speak and teach to someone in English, then you're not going to, you're not going to speak to them in French. And if you're speaking to somebody up in Boston or New York, you're not going to talk, to, and talk like somebody from, I don't know, South Georgia. Did I insult somebody from South Georgia right now? Uh, you have to speak to them incorrectly, like you, they talk up in the Northeast, right? Anybody from the Northeast I, I just alienated? Uh, so who are you going to, wh whoever you're talking to, that's the kind of language you're going to use. And Matthew's account, how many times, when you think about it, how many times does Matthew go to the trouble of telling us, look, you know, through the Holy Spirit telling us, this is written to you so that you're going to believe on the basis of this is a prophecy that's fulfilled. This is so that this prophet had his words fulfilled. I mean, it's all throughout the Gospel of Matthew. Just by my counting, in 28 chapters, 28 chapters, 17 times, you have prophetic Scripture fulfilled. That's just by my counting. Uh, commentators go by different counts sometimes, but prophetic Scripture 
Uh, you have 17 times in 28 chapters. I think he's trying to drive a point home. There's multiple other Old Testament references. And you think about why these gospel accounts are written. They're not just written so that we have something to study here tonight. They were written for that, I think. I think surely God wanted people to be taught from these accounts throughout all time. But if you think about why these were accounts were written at the time, how hard would it be to persuade a Jew that Jesus truly is the Son of God? Because God wants everybody to be saved. And those Jews are convinced, right, before they become believers, if they choose to be, that Jesus wasn't Messiah. How do you convince them? How do you make them convinced that truly he is the Son of God with power, that truly he's the fulfillment of Scripture, right? You use their teachings. You use what they know. Isn't that a pretty good way to teach? I mean, how do you teach someone that doesn't know something? You start from where they are. You start from where they are, and you take them to where they need to be. And that's what Matthew does time and again in this gospel. Let me tell you, he says, about Jesus. Let me give you Jesus' words. And many times, it's weaving in the Old Testament prophecies, the Old Testament writings, so that they will believe, so that they will be saved. That's the point. That's the point many times in the Gospel of Matthew. And so the idea of Old Testament Scripture being woven in, I mean, that's, that's just to be expected then. If this is, as we think it is, surely written to the Jews by a Jew for the Jews. The lineage in Matthew 1, how important is lineage to a Jew? Don't tell me very. So let me ask you, why, why is lineage so important to the Jews? Yeah, if you're not Abraham's seed, you are not. You cannot be pleasing to God, right? That's how a Jew would think. How would they know who their priests were? Well, their lineage, right? How would they? You think about the number of times in the Old Testament Scripture where they go to great lengths to tell you who's involved with what, right? When Don's teaching or Jonathan's teaching from Nehemiah, part of our theme, right, built on Nehemiah, you know, building this year. Think about when that book's written, when names are woven in there. They want you to remember and not forget who's involved with these things, who's responsible for these things. That, that matters to us today, right? And so, you know, here in this case, what's also proven through the lineage that Matthew trots out? And just, we're not going to read it all, right? I'm not going to read the lineage. You can read it on your own. And what, what names do you find there that you would probably be surprised by? Anybody know one of them that you think, man, that person shouldn't be in the lineage of Jesus? Rahab. Yeah, nothing like having a harlot in your lineage, right? Or how about the David and Bathsheba story? That's one to highlight in your lineage, right? And you think about what God does through Matthew's gospel. He gives you the lineage, yeah, in 14 generations to the point of the exile, 14 generations coming out of the exile, 14 generations get from Abraham to David, all the, the definition that Matthew gives. But what's the point? What is the point to that? What can God do with anybody, whether it's Rahab or the David and Bathsheba saga, whatever it is, what can God do with anybody? Is there anybody he can't use? Is there anybody who's worthless in God's sight? Because what are we real quick to do? Well, they're just, not, they're just not worthy almost in our minds to know about God. If we're not careful, we'll go right there because they're not right from the right people. They're not from the right place. And what's God show in Matthew 1? Anybody, anybody can be used by God in his service. So it's powerful the way Matthew begins the, the gospel account and the way he continues it, weaving in Old Testament prophecy and, and text so that if you're a Jew, you really have cause to really consider strongly, could Jesus truly have been Messiah? Plus, that whole beginning with the lineage, hey, remember, Anybody can be used in God's service. Anybody. And so even with the way he begins, that's interesting. You could follow that along, and that would make a good study. That's not really our focus. That's a, that's a pretty good platform to start from, though. Really, the gospel account, and all four of them do this, but Matthew, to my mind, does it probably more than the other three. It's a gospel account that really shows you a progression. P 
people become something that they aren't. Now, that might seem obvious to us, but it shouldn't be. You, you consider the stories that you have in Matthew. It's the stories of what? People being healed, people coming to Jesus to be taught. There's stories of his followers, his disciples, who don't know really what this is all about, a spiritual kingdom, but they become to be better versed in that. And they're still struggling with it at the end of his earthly ministry. And yet they're in a better place at the end than they were at the beginning. And then you see that progression, of course, through the epistles. John is a much different person by the time you get to 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John when those are written than when he was one of the sons of thunder, right? Peter's a much different person when he's writing those epistles than what he was when he's following Jesus, wielding the sword in the garden. You think about it. What's the lesson there? What should being with Jesus do for us? What's Matthew point out that should be very obvious to us? If you spend time with Jesus, how does it change you, right? I mean, it should be changing you, and it surely changed them. And so the study of a, a progression, really a preparation for service in the kingdom is what, gospel, what the gospel of Matthew really focuses on. And so that's what we're going to take our time with. So Matthew chapter 1 so you have the, the lineage, right? In Matthew chapter 2, after we're told about Jesus as <clears throat> Jesus is coming into the earth by means of a virgin birth, by Matthew chapter 2, you have God really pointing out what this is all about, what he's going to focus on. Savior's coming into the, coming into the, coming into the world. And by chapter 2, we're told that Jesus is born in Bethlehem, the days of Herod the king. And Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem looking for the king of the Jews, is how he's going to be thought, right? We saw a star in the east have come to worship him, and Herod is very worried. And from that point, and building from that point, the gospel narrative focuses on who Jesus is as a king and what his kingdom is really going to be like. So that's really where we're going to focus. Um, and the Old Testament Old Testament passages that I mentioned start to be woven in pretty quickly. Herod in verse 3 is troubled, right? All Jerusalem with him because these magi are coming in, these wise men from the east looking for the child that's been born. He's worried, he's troubled because he doesn't want to lose power. This would have been towards the end of, near the end of Herod the Great, Herod the Great Builder's life, trying to hang on to power. And so they gather the scribes, the chief priests, together. Herod inquires of them where Messiah is to be born, and they tell him in Bethlehem in Judea. And notice by verse 6, you have the first, or some of the first Old Testament verses woven in. For, what, for this has been written about him by the prophet. In verse 6, we're told, And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah. For out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Someone who will shepherd my people Israel. The idea of a ruler who's going to shepherd out of Micah 5 is what the king's told. And again, you think about what these people would have considered from this point forward about Jesus. From the beginning of his life, this is supposed to be a king. What's the first thought that goes through your mind if I say a king is coming? What's a king wield? King has power. How much power? Absolute power, usually in these days. You don't generally have constitutional monarchies. I mean, kings have power. Why would Herod the Great, Herod the Great, Herod the Builder, as he's called sometimes, the person that built the new temple, right? Herod's temple. Some of that temple mount's still there, you know. I mean, what Herod does, the great fortress at Masada, the great architectural things that Herod accomplishes, I mean, Herod's worried about staying on the throne. If there's a challenger now in town, what do you need to do with that challenger? You have all power. What do you know about people that have power many times? They want to give it up? Not usually. I mean, very few people that come to power that just voluntarily give it up. You can name them off almost on one hand. Right? George Washington voluntarily gives up power lays down the presidency and walks away from it after two terms. It wasn't just that he was sick of Congress, but that was part of it. Presidents are always sick of Congress. 
It's that he knew it was a bad thing to have one person hang on to power too long. And so he lays it down, walks it away. James Polk walks away after one term as president. That's pretty unusual. It's very uncommon for a king to say, hey, look, I know my time is over. I'm going to leave now. It just doesn't usually happen. Unless they can be absolutely sure of who's going to take over for them, and they're okay with that, and that doesn't likely happen. And so Herod wants to get rid of this presumed king of the Jews. And so what story do you have, infamously told in Matthew? What's Herod do with all those little boys under the age of two? Slaughters them. By that time, what's, what's Joseph been told? Take Mary, take the child that's been born, and they go to where? Out of Egypt, I will call my son. And you start to weave in more of the Old Testament verse. If I'm a Jew, why should I believe? Well, look at all these things that happened. Look at all these Old Testament prophecies that are fulfilled. Out of, out of Egypt, I will call my son. So when Herod dies, and Herod dies relatively soon after Jesus is born, then they come back, and they settle in Nazareth again to say he's going to live in Nazareth. It's because the Old Testament said he's going to live in Nazareth. So he's born in Bethlehem. Out of Egypt, he's going to be called. And then he lives in Nazareth. All those things. If you're a Jew, you're thinking, yeah, all those things line up. But think about a king for just a minute, just a minute longer, since it's such a focus. Herod wants to hang on to power. Most people like power. What does power presumably do for someone, whether it's a king or whether it's a whomever it is? What's power supposedly do for a person? Right? Well, you can. It can do anything you want, so how would you say that? What's it allow me to do? It allows me to do anything. How many choices do I have? If I have power, if I'm a king, how many choices do I have? Unlimited. How many people would like unlimited choices? That would be nice. I could pick out my favorite ice cream to eat every day of the week, right, and just give away the rest that I don't eat that night. I would be happy. So would others in this room that I know of, right? And so, you know, that's great, unlimited power. I could just make baseball trades happen to benefit my favorite team, although the Cardinals just traded for Nolan Arenado. I'm very happy. If you don't know anything about that, you still have time to be a great American and learn about baseball. But you can make anything happen that you want. What, you know, that's why people gravitate to power. Now, what do they find out usually? Herod dies a broken man. By all accounts, Herod dies a shell of himself. Whether you have power or not, eventually the end of life comes, but you try to hang on to it. And it's interesting. It ends up almost every time the same way. So Herod's desperately trying to hang on to power. He hears king. He thinks what we think. Somebody with power, somebody that can supplant me, somebody that can take away what I have. Okay, that's Herod. When we think king, we think similar things, except we don't wield all the power. If we think we have a king, right, what do we suppose about that king? What can a king do for me? This wasn't true. There never would have been kings around from, for very long at all. They just would have been overthrown. What's the supposition about what a, what a king can do for me? What's that? They can protect me. Matthew, how important is protection? Don't say very. Mm -hmm. If I am protected and we're all together, the, the, the idea is, well, I don't have to worry about that. I've got, I mean, how much do we value the police? I know it's become a politicized thing because virtually everything in America has become politicized. But how important are the police to us? How important is the rule of law to us? Because we can walk out of this building tonight, probably safely, God willing, we can all drive home and not worry about being attacked. We could all come to this, look, at, look around. I Man, I know I am highly encouraged tonight because there's so many people in this auditorium, first time in 10 months on a Sunday night, here you are not taking your second nap of the afternoon. I mean, this is great, right? We all got here safely because we assume that we're protected. We don't have a king, we have rule of law. But why would I substitute my choices, my liberty for a king? Well, the supposition is they're going to protect me. What else goes along with that? Not just protection, but what else? What else? What else does a king give me? 
Because this, sir? Oh, man, you go right to the negative, Don. Why would I go along with taxes? Because we all do. That's right. That's right. Without taxes, I'm not going to get that protection. None of us likes paying taxes. And yeah, what? If we don't like it in this country, we can vote in another bunch of knuckleheads to try to, I say that, to, to change the tax laws. In a monarchy, you don't have that opportunity. You can appeal, maybe, but probably not. And the king's going to do what the king's going to do. But taxation's a real thing. That is now. And especially for Herod, especially in this era. I mean, that's ancillary to the study, but if the Romans, as they are, are ruling over everything and Herod's ruling for them, think about if we had an extra layer of government in the United States, like we needed another one, right? How many more taxes would have to be collected to support that administration? I mean, I don't even want to think about it. And so, yeah, taxes are a real part of life. So protection, right? Financially, we've got to pay for it. How about stability? Anybody like a stable life, peaceful life? That's why you're going to support a king, or at least go along with it. When people hear that Jesus is supposed to be the king of the Jews, what do they assume? What do Jews assume especially? I mentioned the Romans are ruling over everything in this era, right? Everything in this area, the Romans are ruling over. I mean, since the time of Pompey the Great, I mean, they had come through this area, that includes Palestine. In the 50s and 60s BC, they control it all. What do you want if you don't have your independence, right? But your independence. What do the Jews want? They want a return to glory. They want the Davidic kingdom. You know that. What are they thinking when they hear the king of the Jews has been born? They're thinking salvation, but salvation physically. That's what they're thinking. I mean, if you get nothing else out of the last 15 minutes of class, understand that. People get it wrong here, and they will continue to get it wrong. They look for physical salvation and not spiritual salvation. They're looking for a physical king, not a spiritual king. They're looking for a physical kingdom, not a spiritual kingdom. And Jesus will spend his earthly ministry trying to sort that out for them. Let me tell you what the kingdom's about. They never do quite get it right. What do some people still look for? Still. Well, the end of the world's coming, right? Because we've got all these problems. So there's going to be a showdown in the Middle East. You ever hear people talk like that? You are going to have what? Like the book of Revelation talks about, you're going to have the be-all, end-all, parking lot throwdown between good and bad. It's all coming to an end. People are still looking for a physical solution. And Jesus, time and again, teaches contrary to that, contrary to that. So, obviously we need a king. He's our king. Why? Order. Jesus doesn't tax us, but what does he require of us? We don't pay money to Jesus. I understand we give a contribution on the first day of the week because we're commanded to him because it keeps the, the spreading of the gospel possible in a physical world. Jesus doesn't ask for our monetary contribution to him, but what does he require of us? Our love and our obedience. And the two ought to be in that order. Love without obedience is just tyranny, right? I'm just obeying because I don't want to get in trouble. But if I love him, I'm going to want to obey him. If I love him, it's for a good reason, though. Why am I, why am I accepting of a spiritual king in my life? The stability, the security... What else does a king give? And Jesus certainly gives this. How much direction does a king give? How about all direction, right? One of the first things, even in our society, we don't have a monarchy but a democratic republic. What's one of the first things we look for in a president when they are declaring, right? Can they actually lead? What's part of leadership? Because that's an overworked term these days. More important word for us really is how well do we follow? Are we a good disciple? People are all wrapped up in leadership. What's the mark, though, of a decent leader? What do they have to have for a group of people? Honesty. Well, honesty is part of it. I'd agree with you that. Huh? Concern, for them. Concern, compassion, which is why I'm going to love them. What else? 
Sir? A little louder. Vision, yes. Vision. These are 56-year-old ears, but it's the only set I have. All right, so I'm going to just try to deal with them. You have vision or direction, right? Allegiance. Allegiance. And, and, you know, if I really love him, if I trust his vision and his direction, I'm, I'm going to follow him. I mean, that's what Jesus requires. So as a spiritual king, spiritual king, what? He's allowing us the opportunity to follow him. I mean, that's the point, isn't it? I mean, that's what he tries to get to in these teachings in the Gospel of Matthew. And you think about why that is. God's not a God of chaos. He's a God of order. You see that the, the deeper they look into the heavens, what do they find out? It's an ordered universe. The deeper they look into human bodies, what do they figure out, scientists? That there's order to this. It's not random chance. And we serve a God of order, not a God of chaos. It makes sense that God would send his son to be a spiritual king, so we have direction, so we don't have to guess. So we're given guidance. We're given protection. We're given a shield, if we care to have it, right, in a spiritual war. And we're commanded not just to follow orders, but we're given good reason to love him and really then follow out of that love, right? I mean, that's what it's supposed to be about. We need a king. What's the problem with that? Because what Jesus tries to get to time and again in the Gospel of Matthew, as you read it through, is this very point. This is why you need a spiritual king. And this is what a spiritual kingdom is going to look like. Why do you need a king? Well, how much vision do we have some days? Answer, not much. And it's not that we're stupid people. I don't think that's it. But as far as big picture stuff goes spiritually, what are you worried about every day? I understand. You're good people. You worry about serving God. I get it. How hard is it to always keep direction and vision? regarding what's most important. When you wake up tomorrow, if God gives you another day and your eyes pop open, what's the first thing you're thinking of after hopefully you remember to pray to God and give thanks? Don't tell me you're going to open your eyes and pray you have another hour to sleep, right? Why am I on sleep today? I don't know. I got a good nap too. What are you going to be worried about? Especially if you have kids. Even if you don't have kids, if you have an older parent, you're worried about them today. If you don't have an older parent and you don't have, you know, you've got somebody you're worried about today. Even if you're a selfish person, you're worried about what's happening next physically, right? You are. We are physical beings, right? We are spiritual people wrapped in physical shells. We care about what happens physically. We get all wrapped up in it sometimes. And so we need somebody to give us direction to give us leadership, to give us protection, to give us guidance. We don't like to think about it this way, but Jesus puts it you know, pretty plainly in his teaching. He's our shepherd. Why? <laughs> Nobody likes this. This isn't a very attractive way to think about things. But why does Jesus call himself our, our good shepherd? Because what are we? Yeah, start buying now, right? We are sheep, which means left to our own devices, we're aimless. We don't have natural protection, in a sense, right? Because we're up against an enemy that doesn't play fair. We're up against a spiritual enemy that will stop at nothing to destroy us. And unless you keep that fully and completely in the front of your minds, you will not look for the guidance that you need. Now, Jesus gets that across in his teachings. Remember who you are. And remember, he tells us, who I am. And you are defenseless without me. You can't do it without me. What's the big hurdle we've got to clear then? Because we're smart people, right? Man, we're Americans. We're used to having our independence. What's the first thing that's got to go on the altar? If, you've really, if you really want to follow the Lord, what's the first human characteristic that's got to go on the altar if you accept that you can't protect yourself, that you are defenseless, that you can't guide yourself to heaven? that you don't have some heavenly GPS that's going to take you right there. What's the first thing that's got to go on the altar? Obedience. Yes, but why? What do I have to accept that I can't do but those things? So what characteristic do I have to sacrifice? My pride. My pride's got to go first. Why is it that Jesus preaches that unless you're like a child, you can't enter the kingdom of God? 
Not childish, like those little kids upstairs going to class right now, right? I don't know if they're any better behaved on a Sunday night than a Wednesday night, but remember what you were like on a Wednesday night. I'm hoping Sunday nights go a little bit better. We'll find out. The teachers come down, their hair is on fire or something, right? Not childish, but childlike, which means humble, which means you're looking up to him. That means that you're taking your, not just your cues, but your, your real direction from him because you can't do it on your own. That's tremendously humbling. I mean, it can't be more humbling than that because we all like to think we can do it on our own. And so why a king? Well, because we need a king. When you think about the nature of a kingdom, and Matthew was getting to it. I mean, what, what's a kingdom offer us but that protection, that, that refuge? You show me a king with a kingdom, especially in medieval Europe, what, what do they have? To protect their people, what's a monarch build? Yes, with tax dollars, and yes, with labor. But what's a monarch build to protect their people? Yeah, walls. You think about it. You show me a monarch, you show me a kingdom. I'll show you a castle, I'll show you walls. And if you look at a broken down kingdom, I'll show you broken down walls, and I'll show you a kingdom that doesn't last very long. What we would like to see in our weakest moment is just what these people in the first century would have liked to have seen, and that is a physical king with a physical kingdom, with physical walls that we can reach out and touch. Isn't that true? That's what people are looking for many times. Give me that tangible sign. And yet we are asked to believe that there is a spiritual king with a spiritual kingdom with spiritual defenses. So where's the evidence? I know, we can pick up the word, and if we choose to believe it, there it is. I got it. But today, right now, what evidence is there that there's a spiritual king, spiritual kingdom, spiritual defenses? Any? Or is this just all sort of made up? It is. We can just all go home and get, you know, that second nap, right? What's that? Yes, we have... You know, Jesus' resurrection, which points to, you know, the, the miracles that God's able to perform, yes. But what about today? Any evidence today as you look around the world? Because we can feel pretty, pretty much at risk, right? So many things out of control. Anything evidence God's power today? Always. Just look around the natural world. Think about the Psalms. Think about how, think it was any different for David? I don't think it was. I, I think it was different circumstances. It wasn't different for David. It wasn't like David had a, had a physical God he could reach out and touch, right? But David chose to believe on the basis of what he saw around him. You think about it. I mentioned the universe and the human body. How many evidences physically do we have? Because that's what you're really talking about. How many times, how many times have things happened in your life that you couldn't have caused to happen but they were good things. How many times did you have bad things in your life? Because bad things happened to us all, and yet good things came from them. Maybe you didn't see it for a year or two years or three years or ten years later. And you look backwards and you realize God had a hand in that. Go figure that God's providence is real, and we pray for a reason. So there's evidence for the nature of God's kingdom, but it is a hard one for people to get over. The idea of a spiritual king with a spiritual kingdom and real spiritual defenses that we really do need. Like every kingdom, it's got a defined area. God's kingdom is his believers, isn't it? Created all things. You imagine the frustration. I mean, God's so far above us. It's not like this, I'm convinced. But in my little human mind, I, I can't imagine the frustration I would have if there were a bunch of people that I loved and they would not follow what I told them to do, even though what I told them to do was going to save them. Can you imagine that? That describes little kids, by the way, doesn't it? You can try, and it describes some people that act like little kids. They're supposed to be grown. You can tell them what to do. They won't do it. And just why? Well, because they want to do what they want to do. And that's, that's the problem that, that people have with God. You've got to lay down your pride. You've got to lay down your choices. You have to really try to follow him. And so you've got a defined area in the sense that that's his, that's his believers. Right? 
You've got to have an acknowledged sovereign to have a kingdom. Well, the resurrection, as Eric said, the resurrection shows that Jesus truly is who he claimed to be. Not just the crucifixion. There have been plenty of people crucified, but the resurrection. And you've got to have a people that are subject to a reign and rule. Well, you read through the Gospel of Matthew, and that's what Jesus is getting to. Let me tell you about my kingdom. He's talking about a people subject to his reign and rule. That means you don't get to vote. That runs very counter to what we're used to. Of all the people throughout all time, it might just be that modern Americans have the most opportunity and really reason some days to believe, and yet have the most opportunity and reason to, to just opt out of the reign and rule of God, the reign and rule of His Son, because we're so used to making our own decisions, so used to voting, so used to representation. We're so used to citizenship. And yet, what are we called to be as sons and daughters of him? But subjects to his authority. We are subject to a king. We're not citizens under that kingship. And of course, you've got a code of conduct, then. You've got a code of law that Jesus institutes. The Sermon on the Mount, when we get to it, you think about the Sermon on the Mount. If you haven't read it in a while, read it. We'll be there in just a few nights or a few, uh, few weeks. The idea of that is reframing the law, isn't it? You know, you've heard this, but I tell you, this is what it's really about. I mean, that's a code of law. That is a code of conduct for people. Remember that. Do those things, and you can follow me. So all those things, you know, accepting Jesus as a king, accepting a spiritual kingdom as reality, not just some sort of pipe dream, but really something that's real, and real for all of us. And I'll tell you what, it's real for an unbeliever and a believer. It's not like it just doesn't exist for an unbeliever. It's just it's unacknowledged by an unbeliever. You know, the, the value of that code of law that, that Jesus really does enunciate and the value of having that protection, all that is spelled out in the Gospel of Matthew. And all that calls for a preparation. All that calls for a dedication uh, of ourselves. And it called for a preparation and dedication of those people back then. You think about it, before Jesus goes to the cross, he's effectively anointed. In John 12, when he's anointed, I mean, that's, that's why Jesus didn't stop that. When Mary pours that expensive perfume, remember, on Jesus, and, and, and remember what was said. Hey, Jesus said, don't do that. We take that and sell it and use the money to help the poor. And Jesus said what? You will always have the poor with you. You need to value, effectively, he said, you need to value me right now. You will always have the poor with you. He's being anointed for his burial and then his resurrection, his kingship. You think about to the end of his earthly ministry, at the end of the Gospel of John, Pilate's confused, right? Are you the king of the Jews? Remember that? Remember how he asked the question? Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said, you're correct. It's for that reason I was born. Pilate's clearly curious, and what Jesus tells him is what? My kingdom's not of this earth. If my kingdom was of this earth, my followers would defend me. They'd fight for me. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. That was a curious thing to say to Pilate in Pilate's mind. It makes perfect sense to us. His kingdom's not of this world. We're called to be sons and daughters of a king, not of this world. You want Christianity, you really got to work for it. It's there, you can do it, but it takes a day-to-day -day discipleship. It's very possible, but it's a choice. God, I think, treats us with great respect in that way. We're not forced into it. It's a choice. We choose to follow him or not. And so the preparation, the dedication, we've got just a couple minutes, but look at Matthew 3. In Matthew 4 with me, and you see a preparation and a dedication. After in Matthew chapter 2, we're told about Herod killing those small children. After Jesus comes back from Egypt and they settle in Nazareth, by Matthew chapter 3, it's one of those stories that especially little boys as opposed to little girls love. I don't know why little girls don't like to hear about, you know, this guy that dresses up in a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. I had two little boys once upon a time in my household that just would have loved to live like that. 
That's true. How many, how many guys in here would have loved that as little boys? You know, and I don't know about the locusts and wild honey. I would have taken wild pizza or something, but you know, wild honey. What does John come out there to do in the wilderness outside Jerusalem? Down in the Jordan River, what's, what's John doing? Well, he's baptizing, right? What is the point? It's a preparation, isn't it? Why do you need to prepare to see a king? Why do you have to prepare for a kingdom? If you had a king to go see, just put it this way, or if you were going to see the president of the United States, would you prepare? Yes. If you were getting ready to do anything of importance, would you prepare? And the answer is yes again. You had to prepare to come here tonight. You have to prepare to start your day tomorrow. You know, we prepare for a lot of things. We prepare for exams. We prepare for marriages. We prepare for all kinds of stuff. Certainly, you need to prepare for the king. And so when John preaches and teaches down in the Jordan, that's what he preaches. You need to get right, is what we would say. You need to repent. The kingdom's at hand. And unless you repent, you're not going to be ready for the kingdom. And if you're not ready for the kingdom, what? There's no protection for you is the basic story here, isn't it? You need to repent. You need to turn your life around because the king is on the way and the kingdom is a real thing. All right? And so that's just where he goes in Matthew 3. When Pharisees and Sadducees come out for baptism, he said to them in verse 7, you brood of vipers who warned you to flee from what? The wrath to come. Yes, there's going to be salvation for believers, but there's going to be that separation between believers and unbelievers. If you're not in the spiritual kingdom, you are unprotected. You are lost. And so that's just the way John puts it. All right? And so what we need to do from this point forward on the Sunday nights that we have is kind of unwrap this matter of, we'll take care of the rest of the preparation and dedication next Sunday, but unwrap this matter of who Jesus is as king. How does he describe it? And what is the kingdom about? And how are people developing and progressing towards being better potential subjects of a kingdom that they can't see but they need to believe in because that's what God wants for us? All right, I appreciate y'all being here tonight. Before we break up and the kids come down the stairs, let's have a word of prayer. We thank you, Father, so much for the good things that you do for us again. We thank you for this hour that we've had to study your word. We thank you, Father, that you protect us and care for us. We thank you, Father, for you, Son, who came to this earth. Watch over us this week. We pray it should be with us. We pray it should help us, Father, be all that we need to be in this world so that we're pleasing to you, but also that we can serve you more fully. We thank you for your protection. We thank you for your guidance. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Have a good night, and thanks again.